Tonight, 30 years on from the historic Mabo decision, we reflect on what's been achieved and the challenges still ahead. Momentum is growing for an Indigenous voice to Parliament, but the task of uniting the nation remains. Welcome to Q&A. I'm Stan Grab. We're coming to you live from Sydney tonight. Joining me on the panel, constitutional lawyer and author Shireen Morris, New South Wales Liberal MP Julian Lisa, who chairs the Standing Committee on Indigenous Affairs. Australia's first female Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney. Member of the Indigenous Voice Senior Advisory Group, Chris Kenny. Priest, human rights lawyer and academic, Frank Brennan. And joining us for part of tonight's discussion, we have Gail Marbo, daughter of land rights campaigner Eddie Kweeki Marbo. She joins us from the library named after her father from James Cook University in Townsville. Please make everybody feel welcome. Now, before we begin our program tonight, we'd like to pay our respects to former Chief Justice Sir Gerard Brennan, who passed away last night, aged 94. Sir Gerard wrote the lead judgment on the Mabo decision, recognising native title for the first time. Tomorrow marks the 30th anniversary since that historic making or history making case, and Sir Gerard's son Frank is on our panel tonight. I pass on our condolences as well, Frank. Mm. We thank you for being here for this thank important you. discussion. And we'll get some more reflections uh, a little later in the program. Our first question tonight, though, is on that topic, and it comes from Olivia Parsons. <laughs> uh, my question is for the panel, in particular for Gail Marbo. I'm just wondering what you think the biggest impact of the Marbo decision has been for Indigenous Australians. Gail. Well, um, for me, I think it has been the recognition of Indigenous peoples on their country by doing acknowledgements of country and acknowledging those who are still there on their lands and giving them the opportunity to speak their language, do their dance and share their songs. So therefore, for me, that's the greatest step forward is just acknowledging them who have always has always been here and will always remain to be here and be the first nation first peoples of this country mm. and Gail when you reflect on on the 30 years uh, and what's been achieved what still remains do you think what would your father think today looking at what's happened but also the road ahead well I think that that comes down to where where are we now because if we're stepping into a new government and we're stepping into the, that hole where the government wants to see change and also that whole momentum of, of what Mabo has done and what Mabo can do in the future because Mabo isn't just about land. Mabo is about a lot of things and it's, it's a how you apply that to what you need to do to move forward because Dad has just given you, you know, the path. It depends on what you pick up off that path to help you move forward and help you understand where we need to go. Because one door's open, now it's time for the next door to be open. Mm. So maybe we can do that as a collaborative to move things forward. Frank Brennan, um, when we consider your, your father's legacy, take us back to that moment. What did it mean to him to be involved in that case and, and write that lead judgment? Oh, I think probably for him it was the culmination of being an honourable lawyer and Australian citizen. Uh, when I think of his history, uh, a lot of talk about the Pacific at the moment, isn't there? Mm. Uh, he, in the 1960s, was called into a big case in Fiji, which turned out to be about the land title of Fijians. And for him as an Australian, this opened his eyes. He came back, the Whitlam government was elected, and he was appointed as the lawyer for the Aborigines of the Northern Land Council in formulating the Aboriginal land rights in the Northern Territory. But then as a lawyer on the High Court, he spent 10 years while the Northern Territory government was constantly appealing provisions of that act 
So I think he probably got to educate his fellow judges about the reality mm. of Aboriginal relationships with land. So then when Mabo came along in 1992, um, he'd had, you know, 25 or 30 years as a lawyer wrestling with these difficult questions where he knew that terra nullius was just not on. The, the idea, of course, that this was an empty land yeah. for the taking. Yeah, that it just, it had no credibility. And particularly in 1975, there'd been the decision of the International Court of Justice. In fact, I've often thought with the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, you'll all know that there's that very eloquent provision in it about ancestral land between land of mother nature, people born therefrom, remaining attached thereto, returning mm. thither. The, the, I think the, the spiritual notion of sovereignty. Yeah, but I think you and Linda would agree. That's not very Aboriginal language, but it was a wonderful quote from my father's judgment, oh. which in turn was a quote from Judge Amun, a Lebanese judge in the Western Sahara case in 1975, which in turn was a quote from a Congolese lawyer appearing for Zaire mm. about wow. Western Sahara, who appeared in The Hague and said, you Europeans treat us as primitives, and yet we have a life, a culture, which is so robust, and it's about time you Europeans woke up to it. And that's what we now celebrate, but it's also the complexity that we now deal with mm -hmm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. Linda, what are your memories of, of the Mabo judgment and, and the legacy of it today? Look, thank you, Stan. I acknowledge country and um, give my deep regard to your family, Frank. Thank you, Linda. I remember exactly where I was mm. and what I was doing when it came onto the radio that the High Court had uh, come down in favour of, of Gail's dad and his, his fellow uh, petitioners. I was on City Road, not far from here, and I listened to it and I thought, finally, finally, I felt so legitimate because that notion of terra nullius was thrown out and it was recognised that this was not an empty land. In fact, prior ownership was absolutely uh, decided that day. And I think the second thing, Stan, is that it was really the first time in Australian history that law was being made in terms of land between Aboriginal people and the High Court of Australia. So those two things, but particularly getting rid of that notion, that lie, that fallacy of, of terra nullius. Mm. Gail, I'll just come back to you for a, a quick observation. Of course, there was no guarantee, was there, that this case was going to succeed. Your father had fought through the, the various courts of Queensland and persisted and persisted and persisted and sadly didn't live to see the judgment. Give us a sense of what, what inspired your father, what kept him going? I think um, what kept him going was actually the, the notion that if he was to lose, what was the outcome of his children? Because he wanted to make sure that, that we did have that land because to him, it was who we are and that's where we're connected to. So to lose that is to lose what? To lose who you are. And he was trying to instill in us the whole strength of our, cultural, our culture, which was the basis of everything that we, he knew that moved us forward. So therefore, if we take away the land, who are we? Mm. We lost people. So therefore, that fight was his, was his mantra that he wanted to make sure that we had entitlement to that land. Mm. Thank you, Gail. Our next question comes from Mick Scarcella. In 1992, we had a crazy scare campaign for many about the Mabo decision. I'd like to know how many of you on the panel know any non-Indigenous people who had blackfellas performing corroborees with their extended families and had their backyards ripped up and taken over. Are we likely to see a repeat of these ludicrous crimes when a referendum is called about constitutional change? Julian Lisa. 
Well, look, I, I hope that we're not. Um, uh, I don't know anybody who, uh, who, who had their backyard claim, but uh, um, I think we need to remember what a revolution um, in the law Mabo was at the time. Um, it, it's such a historic case and we're talking about it because it changed the law so much from what had been there beforehand. I think if I can go back to the point that uh, um, you, you put to, to Gail, uh, um, I think the key thing that's come out of Mabo is actually native title itself. Since Mabo, there have been 577 determinations of native title. Native title now covers 43% uh, of the Australian landmass, which is, which is extraordinary. Um, at the time, you're right, uh, there was lots of concern from mining interests and pastoralists about the effect of native title. But now, mining companies and pastoralists uh, are some of the, the people who are most forward-looking in terms of trying to find ways of working with Indigenous people to try and get benefits for them. And I think that's the next mm. phase for dealing with native title. Well, more we're going broadly. to pick up that question of native title in just a moment because there are still questions remaining about that and potential need for reform. But just to come back to, to the question here, Chris Kenny, what's the, the risk of, a, of an old-style culture war? around this, around the voice, around the, the referendum on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, with all of the, the scare campaign that we've seen in the past. Yes, yeah, certainly I remember the Mabo scare campaigns. It was revolutionary. It was, there was a lot of uncertainty in the country and there was, of course, as you say, some ridiculous uh, scares perpetrated. You get that in all debates. We're getting that all the time in the climate debate. We get them all around all sorts of political issues. So far, the debate on the voice in my, has, has seen some furfies put up. We've seen the furphy put up about this being a third chamber. That was uttered by Prime Minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, and another former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has used that phrase as well. Barnaby Joyce, interestingly, interestingly enough, used that phrase, then recognised it was erroneous and apologised for using it. But um, it, it, it's, it, that's not an outrageous scare. But there's, there's been the other, the other point about the voice that we hear all the time, and I'll, I'll continue to address this in public debate and, and in what I write is that it's divisive, is that it's racially divisive. And to me, this is a perversion of a debate. This is a measure entitled to redress Indigenous disadvantage, to uh, be uh, fair and just to Indigenous is, people is in our one, country. Is that what won you over? Because, you know, you, from a conservative political position to embrace the idea of the voice, what was it that convinced you? Because of the, the potential to have better outcome? Was that the, 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 the thing that won you? The, the two things that won me over, and Shireen and I were talking about this in depth many, many years ago, seven or eight years ago, I suppose. But the, the, the two key points is one is to protect the constitution, and this is where Julian's done a lot of work, mm. a constitutional change that won't lead to all sorts of judicial activism. And I was satisfied that that could be done through this measure. But most importantly, that it would lead to practical outcomes for Indigenous people. The Indigenous leaders I was speaking to said, don't give us symbolism. We've had enough of your mm. symbolism over the years. Don't just make some quaint reference to us in the preamble to the Constitution. What does that deliver for Indigenous Australians? But through this measure, there can be an enduring guarantee that Indigenous Australians are consulted about laws made to impact on them. What could be fairer? What could be more just? And you're actually then recognising Indigenous Australians in the Constitution in a practical and useful way so that when they give feedback from the grassroots to government, it will help deliver better education outcomes. It will help deliver better health, better prosperity, job opportunities, better law and order. These are all the practical things that people like Jacinta Price and, and other conservative politicians want to see. Well, the voice is a way to help deliver it. Shereen Morris, as, as Chris said, you've worked across the, the political aisle. You ran for Labor in the Senate at the recent election. You're also an Indian Australian, and I'm wondering what multicultural Australia, and I know you can't speak for everybody, I don't want to put that onto you, but, but is there a sense of what people who don't necessarily share the colonial legacy of the country um, feel about something like the Uluru Statement from the Heart? Absolutely, and I think there's this growing sentiment in the Australian community, particularly among multicultural Australians and, interestingly enough, multi-faith Australians. So just last Friday, there was a joint resolution released by all the peak religious organisations of Australia. But it's not just in those who have this empathy of shared historical experience with, you know, colonial powers overseas. I do really believe there is a deep reservoir of goodwill amongst Australians in favour of this issue. And I think that transcends left or right. You know, I really do. I think this is bigger 
than ordinary political divides. And I think there's a tonne of goodwill on the political right for this um, issue. So, yeah, getting back to the question, I think there will be some scare campaigns and there will be some furfies, as Chris said, put out there. But I think we're in a really good position to tackle those head on, have a respectful, open, honest debate, address the mistruths when they come up in a rational, calm way. And I think the advocates in this um, issue have done the groundwork to do everything possible to get Conservatives on side to minimise that nasty side of the debate because, as Chris explained, um, Indigenous advocates did the hard yards to reach out to constitutional mm. Conservatives, right, early on in the piece. So, as Julian knows really well, this is the only constitutional reform proposal on the table that empowers Indigenous people with a voice in their affairs on the one hand, but also upholds and protects the Constitution protects parliamentary supremacy. So that's why I think we're going to have a nicer and more rational debate than in the past. Of course, there are different Indigenous voices on this as well. And our next question comes from Gwenda Stanley. Gwenda? Gwenda Stanley, Maury, woman in both the Aboriginal 10 Embassy. We have been around for 50 years. Our main aim was about land rights and sovereignty. So we pose the question is, what are we going to get out of this constitution? We have a Labor government, and as you can see up on this panel here, there is no diverse conversation with us as the people. Shireen, you have the interests of the constitution and the crown. What about us as the indigenous people of this country? When as is this government, we have still 50 years still fighting for land rights. You give us native title. We have 30 years of claims that are still sitting under the Land Rights Act as well. When is this government and the Australian government start going to address the holocaust of the genocide in this country? The repertory justice and land back. We do not support the Uluru Statement. I was one of those delegates that was threatened. I was also one of those delegates that was locked out of the Constitution Summit meeting. I would like to know what is in this constitution and how will it benefit us as Aboriginal people in this country? Does anyone else know what they're voting for? Because last time I sat at a Labor rank women's file meeting last year and not one of those Labor members could tell me what was in the constitution. And you are only have the interest of the Crown. Where is the interest of us as Indigenous Australians, First Nation, Gomorrah people, the first impact by colonialism, by pastoral law, while we still have these governments and these Liberal Labor parties still making decisions on our affairs? Does the panel want an invite uh, a voice from all of us, or do you intend to keep continuing locking us out? Let me put that question. Thank you, Gwenda. I'll put that question to you, Gwenda. Um, look, thank you. And uh, know Maury very well and know that there's a reconciliation committee out there doing some very good work. But the point you raise is a really important one. Uh, the Labor Party, the party that I represent, is the party that has, has accepted the Uluru Statement in full. Uh, but uh, I have been around for a long time and we've thought about this very carefully. It'll be my job as the Minister for Indigenous Australians to bring people together, to listen to people that disagree with um, the Uluru Statement, to listen to, listen to people that agree um, and try and find common ground. That is what's important. It, is, it would be absolutely wrong not to listen to everyone's voices and the thing that I see my role as being is to try and build a consensus. Build a consensus with the community and build a consensus across the party. And as Shireen has said, build a consensus in various sectors within the community, be it the faith community, the business community, the non-government sector, Aboriginal organisation, Aboriginal communities. And in any, any negotiation, you have to compromise and you have to listen to what everyone's saying. I would like to think, in a direct answer to your question, that if we can change the Australian Constitution, as much to, like Chris was saying, 
It will address social justice issues for our people because there will be a group of elected people that will have a say on the laws uh, that, af that affect, affect Aboriginal, Aboriginal people. And I would rather have that advice going to the parliament than what we have seen and what you've drawn our attention to over a long mm. period of time of, 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 of failure. So this is an opportunity to get the voices of our people into the parliament and an opportunity to stop the things uh, that haven't worked and to make changes to not only the constitution, but social justice ask outcomes as well. I want to come back to you in just a moment, Gwenda. Can I just put this question to you, um, Frank? Um, if, you, if you go to the, the tent embassy in Canberra, you will see the word sovereignty mm -hmm. and what Gwenda was talking about was sovereignty. But if we go to the, the Mabo case itself, it stopped at the water's edge, didn't it? Of mm -hmm. course it recognised existing, pre-existing and continuing title, but that fell to the soil, if you like, with mm -hmm. British law. But sovereignty had stopped at the water's edge. Why? Because the judges said we're only judges and we're a court set up under the sovereign, under what we would call the crown. And they said we're not here to question our own legitimacy. We're the highest court in the land, but we're not here, we're not able to question the sovereignty which is underlying. And that's why the tent embassy is and has long been an eloquent poetic expression to the nation about questioning the underlying efficacy of the sovereignty of the nation. Could Australia ever deal with that in a, in a real sense? Well, I don't think it can deal with it through the courts. So the question Over is the how we then deal with it as a nation. And as a nation, you would normally do that through your founding document. It would be, I suppose, saying to those of you in the tent embassy, what would be the preconditions for you coming in under the Australian Constitution? What are the things that you would want to see recognised in terms of self-determination? But and remember, remember that the other aspects of the Uluru Statement is about agreement and treaty making, mm. which is a long, complex problem and goes to the heart, I think, of what uh, what's being said. But it's also Linda, the national process Linda, of truth telling. Yeah, I might, I might <coughs> just go back to Gwenda. Gwenda. Where does the Uluru Statement fail in your view, and what would you prefer? Well, first off, the reconciliation was on number 339 of the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We forgot to address the 334 to 338. For 30 years, we've been reconciling. 232 years, we've been reconciling. When is it... When, why are we still trying to integrate <coughs> into a system that systemically oppresses us? We need open dialogues. We need more communication with, on the grassroots, not hand-picked selective representative bodies that are still controlled and dictated by government. We need to come to the table, come to the Aboriginal 10 embassies, sit with us, take it back to the people, take it back to the grass people, us that are still living on these co concentration camps. You call them communities. They are actually concentration camps in this country. The Holocaust happened here in Australia and it needs to be addressed. And we do that by coming to an agreement on our terms, not on government terms. I might just get a comment before we move on. Thank you, Gwenda, to, um, to Gail Mabo. Gail, I'm wondering where your father would sit on questions of the voice, because I know that Eddie Mabo had long campaigned for autonomy <coughs> for Torres Strait. Um, I'm wondering if you're listening to what Gwenda's concerns are, Frank's statements about sovereignty and even how the Mabo judgment did not resolve questions of sovereignty, where do you believe your father would sit on the voice? So for me, I think it, um, what Dad was trying to do was, you know, regain his land, make his make what he wanted to do beneficial for all Australians. Because at that time, you have to think, you know, it was a, it was a height of of land rights, and so Dad was one of those people who you know listened to everything about what was happening for land rights, and he knew people who were fighting in different communities like. He, he knew the people from um, Yurikala who did the bark statement. And, you know, he, he listened to those. He listened to all, all aspects of peoples because to be informed and to move forward, you have to, to listen to all. 
And it's that thing of you have to learn to sit down and listen because if you don't listen to everyone, you can't get their messages across. And you can't be selective on who you speak to. You have to talk to everybody. And it is inclusive of all communities, not just the selected few. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Jacqueline McCarthy. Hi, Julie and Lisa is our local member. So Julie, if you don't mind, um, I'd like to ask you, considering about um, you know, trying to make sure we're all working together, why should you, do you think that people on the right of politics should support The Voice? Thanks for the question, Jacqueline. Um, look, I should say something about my own history in, in this. I'm a constitutional conservative. Um, I wanted to get involved in this because I was concerned about the constitution. I didn't want to see something that had symbolic language that could be used by judges and have unintended consequences. I didn't like some of the other options on the table that related to effectively judges vetoing laws that they considered discriminatory or not for the benefit of Aboriginal people. And so um, I was very lucky to, to meet with Noel Pearson, um, with Shireen, um, with people like Marcia Langton, and this was part of Noel's outreach to constitutional conservatives to try and find a way forward that we could recognise Indigenous people, that we could provide something practical in the Constitution. And I do think that this is practical. The whole point of having consultative advisory bodies, and that's all they are, is to make better policy on the ground. Mm. Um, as the chair of the House Indigenous Affairs Committee, um, we did a, a report into food security in remote communities um, during the pandemic. And one of the things that we found was that it's very hard to keep food fresh in those communities. Now, you might think sitting in Canberra, it'd be a great idea to go and send out a whole bunch of extra fridge storage into those communities. But if you actually go and listen to people, they'll tell you that electricity supply is actually unreliable and intermittent in many of our remote communities. That's a great example of how actually consulting with people on the ground can lead to a Ju better policy outcome. Julian, of course, we still don't know where your side of politics is going to sit on this and whether there'll be bipartisan support for a referendum. Where do you think you'll land? Well, I think we have to see the detail. I mean, this is a policy that uh, the Labor Party took to the election to, to have, a, have a voice, to have a constitutional recognition to implement the Uluru Statement. But we don't have a form of words, we don't have a question, we don't have a full model yet. So there's, there's a possibility that it will be opposed? Well, I, I think you should see what Peter Dutton said in his very first press conference and that he has an open mind to these questions and he's um, wanting to work with Linda and the government on, on these issues. And I think... Uh, uh, we, should, uh, we should absolutely come to this issue. I, as a constitutional conservative who supports the voice and supports it in the constitution, will be doing my bit as well. But um, as the opposition, this is a policy that the government took to the election. It's, it's for them to, uh, to, to put the first draft on the table. Chris, what, one of the points that you've made is that this is not a left or right issue. And as a conservative, you've supported this and on the principle. Um, but there are still political questions to work through, aren't they? How do you believe this is going to play out in this parliament? Well, I think we've got to be very careful and, uh, uh, and we've got to make sure that this not, isn't a partisan issue. I think it's disappointing tonight that everybody on this panel supports the voice. We'll do it from different perspectives. We'll support an in Indigenous voice. And uh, although I've, from time to time, been a mild critic of the ABC, I'm not going to criticise you this time because I know you, you tried you to get a couple of ABC, opponents. Of course, I have indeed. <laughs> but it, the, reason, the reason I'm disappointed we don't have someone uh, against the voice on the panel is because... I, we can't create this concept that the fix is in, that this is a green left idea. This doesn't belong to the green left. Mm. It doesn't belong to the progressive side of politics. It doesn't even belong to the leftist activists in the Indigenous community. Well, we've this had a idea... very strong opposition from Indigenous people tonight to this. We know that Jacinta Price, who's a, a national senator now, mm. um, has opposed this. She believes there are, there are other priorities. We know that, that Lydia Thorpe on the Greens has also raised concerns about this. So while support may be brought a, a, amongst a, 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 you know, the range of politics, there's also opposition across a range of politics. This is the point. To be frank, I don't think if we're talking about the, the Holocaust and uh, making claims about ceding sovereignty to this country, it's going to help the debate. It's only going to uh, polarise the debate and, and put a lot of people on the right of politics right off this idea. I was there on Saturday night, uh, I saw Linda there actually, uh, two Saturday nights ago when Anthony Albanese won victory, claimed victory and, and made the undertaking in his victory speech to deliver a, a referendum on The Voice and, and good on him, he supported it all the way. But immediately I was a little bit alarmed about that 
partisan nature in this. You don't want to think of this as a Labor idea. As Julian mentions, many many people on the right of politics have been involved in this mm. for, for a long while. So what we need to see is the detail. Linda's got the unenviable task of going through all the work that we did in the, in the, in the, the groups uh, over the last couple of years to come up with grassroots, regional, local groups feeding into a national voice so that it can tackle real problems on the ground where there are schools and communities going through all sorts of hardship. We've We've got to get through that detail, but we need to make sure that uh, those people on the right of centre understand that this is not a progressive idea and it is not a symbolic idea. It's an idea to unite the country behind measures that can actually close the gap, something we all want. Just one other point, because I think this is yeah. really important. The 1967 referendum we all think about in this country as, as a real high point in addressing some of these issues where the country came together behind a, a referendum that decided the federal government could make laws yes. in the interests of Indigenous people. If we at that time had added a clause that said, and they should consult those people before making those laws, it would have been uncontroversial. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially all we're saying should be done now. Yeah, I'm going to get Shireen on this because we know that referendums are difficult to get passed. Um, I, I don't know, I want to give anyone's age away here, but maybe none of us have actually voted in a successful referendum. It's been a very, very long time. Back to the 1970s, is that right, Frank? Business the last one was successful. Um, Shireen, getting the, the support necessary, passing that Sorry, double... And you've got to be 97 years of age to have voted in a successful Labor Party sponsored referendum. Wow, <laughs> wow. That's a big lesson. Well, that, 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 that goes to your point, Chris. It can't just be one side of politics. And Shireen, you've got to get a double, you've got to get a double majority. Majority of voters, majority of states. If it does look like it's just a Labor Party exercise, if it becomes politically polarised, it's dead, isn't it? Well, I think, you know, it's wrong to consider this as owned by one side of politics. Uh, in fact, Julian Lisa was a supporter of this proposal long before Labor was. That's the historical fact of this debate. Um, Peter Dutton, the new leader of the opposition, I think actually touched on the best reason for Australians to support this reform. He said he's open to a voice in the Constitution, but he wants to see practical results. And he is spot on. I can't emphasise that enough. And that's why we need voices like his in this debate to focus us on what's important here. He is spot on. And let me tell you, he will find immense agreement with Indigenous leaders on that point. Indigenous leaders like Noel Pearson, who have championed Indigenous responsibility in their affairs for so many years. So, and can I just emphasise, the whole reason Indigenous people rejected symbolism in the Uluru Statement was for the reason Peter Dutton raises, right? They want practical outcomes. They said, we don't want a preamble because we want to close the gap. We want a voice so that local communities can work in partnership with government and parliament to address incarceration, address domestic violence, address alcoholism. So they're on the same page. And sometimes I wish in this debate people would just see how much they're actually on the same page. The last thing I'll say is um, go and read Karina Ocatel's piece in the Sydney Morning Herald today, former vice president of the federal Liberal Party. She makes the conservative argument for a voice because Indigenous women up in the Northern Territory can't get their voices heard when they want to keep communities dry and alcohol free. That's the best argument. There's your homework. Um, our next question comes from Josh Cash. The LGBTQI community only five years ago experienced just how difficult it is to live through a national vote on our fundamental rights. It was a bruising experience and many of us still feel hurt from it. How can we make sure that in trying to deliver a long overdue voice to First Australians, we do not cause the same hurt and harm that was done in 2017? Great. Frank Renner, I, I might be, bring you in here because we had, um, Shireen mentioned before, faith groups have supported the Uluru Statement from the, heart, from the heart and we know that there were some divisions around faith when it came to those issues as well. But just taking that on board, how is this going to play out, do you think, in a public discourse? And what, what's the role of faith groups as well in this? Well, I've always been a bit reserved about the role of faith groups, I have to say, but I welcome the statement by the faith groups the other day. If we look at the history, 1988, the opening of the new Parliament House, 
The first motion introduced into that parliament by Bob Hawke as Prime Minister was precisely about Aboriginal recognition. And it was sponsored by the 14 key Australian church leaders. It fell over at the last moment because the then opposition headed by John Howard questioned the entitlement to self-determination, saying it should be in common with all other Australians. Now, philosophically, that's still where the debate is. I think religious leaders can help to shape the debate. They can also help in calling for respect for all persons within the community. There's got to be room for diversity of opinion mm -hmm. without demonising people. And I think here, faith groups and other community leaders can help in that regard. And I think it would be best done by Mr Dutton and Prime Minister Albanese on a joint ticket saying, whatever your views about this in the end, we are adamant this is going to be done respectfully. Oh, and it is only respectful voices that will be heard. Yeah. I think it's worth remembering how close we are together as a nation on this. Don't believe those who say this is a terribly divisive issue. At the moment, all arms of politics in this country support Indigenous recognition in the Constitution. That's number one. The form is the... Secondly, uh, th there's a virtual consensus across Indigenous Australia that that now can only happen through having a voice. W without a voice, they're not going to go for some second-rate Indigenous recognition. The coalition government, recently deceased, accepted a voice, a, le a legislative voice, not recognised in the Constitution, but a legislated voice, and did all the work led by Marcia Langton uh, and... Um, and, and that sits there, a report, a shape for the voice that would report to government and parliament. The only missing hook is whether or not they would allow that to be enshrined in the constitution. Mm. And we've had former chief justices of the High Court saying that won't be a problem. Uh, so there's not a long way to go if we just treat it rationally, rationally and sensibly. I suppose that falls to you now, Linda. Have, have you reached out thus far? Where are you at in that negotiation consultation phase? And what date have you landed on, if, if at all? Uh, well, we got sworn in 24 hours ago. Oh, yes, but the <laughs> clock is ticking. <laughs> um, and I do want it's to a respond. very, very short time in government. I know, so I almost said, don't that. waste a day. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to respond. I want to respond to the young man that raised the issue of the uh, equal marriage plebiscite and I know how difficult that was uh, in a very real way um, and I know that a lot of people had to hold their nose to get that vote up. Uh, the second point, Stan, that I'd make is this, is let's be honest, the uh, opposition now forbade the group led by Marcia and Tom in considering the Uluru Statement outright. It was not allowed. But I do believe that there is an opportunity now, and I have repeatedly said uh, to, uh, to many people that this is about everyone coming together. And let's not get caught up with the but fact Linda, that it's Linda, just so can, about Can I just come in there, though? I'm, I'm sorry, but <coughs> I, we've heard a lot about coming together, but you're the minister now tasked with getting this up and you've got to have the conversations. And, and in terms of that, when are you going to sit down with Peter Dutton? When are you going to sit down with, with the Greens, with Teals, whoever, and land on a date? Uh, well, I think there is a step before that, um, and that's making sure that... Uh, that the Prime Minister um, is given the respect and the role that he deserves in this and the point of negotiation. Uh, we do, in my view, it would be wonderful to have agreement across the Parliament to provide inspiration to the Australian people. But at the end of the day, Sam, we have in this country a compulsory voting system. So it is people out in hmm. Australia that will make the ultimate decision about this. Getting back to the point that you've made about dates and so forth, um, I believe that we 
shouldn't put the cart before the horse and that we need to listen to people's views, look at the work that's been done, that's already been referred to, yeah. um, and build a consensus and around this. I, I, I want to bring Gail Marbo in really quickly before, before Gail leaves us, but just before that, a really quick comment from you, Julian, about, you know, your, your were tasked with putting some meat on the bone. The process has now moved on from there. But in terms of what Linda is talking about, getting a consensus, having those negotiations, when is your side of politics ready to sit down? Well, I think I'd say two things. Um, I chaired a committee that Linda served on with Pat Dodson, and um, its job was to effectively recommend the consultation, which was just around the voice. It was not about the whole Uluru statement, it was just about the voice. Um, I think Peter Dutton has said he's, he's ready to, to, to take a call, but it's for the government to do, to do that initial work. And Linda is quite right. I mean, this is going to be a matter that all of us have to vote on, and we have to remember a couple of key facts. Most Australians don't actually know we've got a constitution. Those who do, we've got, do know we've got a constitution have never read it. Um, most people are still not engaged in this issue. I mean, I think, Linda, you went at the, three years ago to a series of remote communities mm. and talked to people about the voice and found that people didn't know what they were talking so, so, about. So, so, so just, just, on, piece just on that, to do. Gail Marbo, we're sitting here, to, the voice is five years old. Um, the tent embassy is 50 years old. The day of mourning is 1938. Yes. Um, it's 230 years um, since, since, since colonisation. Now, in your case, 30 years since the Mabo case, how long does it take? How long's a piece of string? Because mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to. We all have to actually look at, you know, everything and, and you know, do, like Linda said, start having those conversations and just bringing people to the table. You know, maybe it's time to, for Parliament to invite the people from 10 Embassy in to actually have a conversation with them. Because, you know, their voice should be heard. Thank you, Gail. Um, I want to thank Gail Mabo for... Thank please thank Gail Mabo for, for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, Gail, of course, is... Um, Gail is preparing for a very busy day of celebration around the 30th Mabo anniversary, which will be marked in Townsville mm. tomorrow. So good luck with that, Gail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on to another topic now, which has been attracting plenty of attention since the election. It's a video from Joe Forward. Last week, Mark McGowan labelled the federal press pack as rude, intimidating oh. and bullying. This followed an election campaign filled with gotcha moments and partisan reporting. Increasingly, Australians feel like the media is biased and too focused on the 24-hour cycle of clicks and headlines. What can we do to fix this system? And would you support substantial media reforms in the 47th Australian Parliament? Chris Kenny, you get to be responsible for all journalists on the panel. Right? <laughs> what, did you, what did you think of the campaign and the way it was conducted? Oh, you, you, you do media critique on Sky, of course. Yeah. yeah, I used to run a media show on Sky. Now I do a nightly show, 5 o'clock. Kenny Report, subscribe, get onto it. <laughs> there you go. Get onto Flash as well. Always a plug. Um, uh, I thought it was a pretty bad campaign and I thought the main reason was that neither party had a strong agenda. You had two major parties without big agendas, no great forward agendas and so we stumbled through a campaign where Anthony Albanese, let's be frank, he had a shocker, uh, but it didn't... But he won. <laughs> he won. Well, and, and Labor's vote went backwards and they won. The Coalition's vote obviously went further backwards. People went to minor parties and independents in their droves basically because they were uninspired by the major parties. Now, uh, it, in, in media coverage, you know, I, I think it's changed dramatically in the time that I've been uh, reporting politics and involved in politics. I think it comes back to this digital era, mm. social media, uh, the pace of, of, of media now is, is extraordinary. And the faster it gets, the more superficial it gets. But I thought um, there was nothing uh, much to complain about of the media coverage this time around. I think there was a focus on gotcha moments because of the way Anthony Albanese started on the first day and he had a few more hiccups along the way. Uh, but it's ever been thus. Mm. Is it the speed, do you think, Shireen? Things move so quickly and people are expected... You know, it's not, it's not a daily news cycle, it's an hourly news cycle. Absolutely. I think that, you know, I think some of these journalists might have been guilty of trying to generate outrage on Twitter <laughs> and generate a viral 10-second video more than they were in drawing out sensible policy discussion. Because, you know, it's not only the job of journalists to hold politician to a 
politicians to account. They're also supposed to inform the public. So, yeah, maybe those gotcha moments, you know, perform well on Twitter and on social media, but for your average disengaged voter out there who actually needs to hear about what policies are going to address their concerns, it does nothing for that. And it contributes to this news cycle that is so quick, as Stan said, that for the last 10 years, the government, previous government was able to sort of get away with rorts and scandals because of this sense that the media cycle just moves on and people forget. So that's where it inhibits journalists' ability to hold politicians to account can, as well. Can I ask the two politicians, but part of, part of your question, and, and, um, and, and thank you so much uh, for the, the video that came in as well, um, Joe, was that the need for reform. Should there be reform, Julian Lisa? Well, I think, you know, people can complain about the media, but the solution is often worse than the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, than, than the actual problem. I mean, the last Labor government had the Finkelstein report, mm -hmm. which would have been a, a massive stifler on free speech. So I think the nature of our democracy is such that um, you, need to have, you need to give the media the freedom to report things in the way they want to. But I think Shireen is right that people are, are, are actually fed up with what the media dishes up because it doesn't inform anybody anymore. And it's very hard for the average voter looking for information to find anything. I mean, I find the best way to get information about what is happening is to read the transcripts of press conferences because sometimes you get something more out of that than you will reading a newspaper mm -hmm. article. Uh, I think the outcome of the election demonstrates that the Australian community is sick of division. Mm. And that's what we saw a lot of by way of the journalism, I think. Um, there were the gotcha moments. It was a long campaign. People got tired and cranky. Um, and, and the media is very centralised in Australia. Um, the issue that you've asked about, should there be reform... And, and what could that even look like? Um, ..is is really something uh, that is, the, is going to be... The, ..or is the responsibility of Michelle Rowland, who is our communication um, minister. Uh, so I, I won't speak on her behalf, except to say that uh, the points that have been made about... Uh, click journalism, uh, getting, getting your name up in lights on social media, I think is distorting what we traditionally think of journalism. I'll just get a quick one from you, Frank, on this. I was just interested mm -hmm. in what Linda had to say about people are tired of division. They may be tired of the rancour, but, you know, we've just had an election where a government's been elected and two-thirds of the country did not put them first in the ballot. We're very divided. People are looking to Teals or to One Nation or, U or UAP or whoever that may be. It's not division that's the problem, is it? It might be the quality of debate or the rancour. And where, how is the media to... Well, it, how, how culpable is the media? It may be, but I regard this as a pretty ordinary sort of election of a government that had gone a term too long. You know, I'm not making a party political point, just they'd been there 10 years, they'd run out of puff and they'd run out of accountability. So I think that, you know, change was in the air. There had been the mi miracle win by Morrison three years before mm. and there wasn't to be another miracle. But what was really novel about this election, I think, were the ten teals or whatever, the cross benches. And I don't think people in those seats were looking so much to media. I think it was a real community-based operation mm. where people were in contact with each other and they weren't listening to what was out of coming out of the Canberra Press Gallery. Mm. Chris, can I get a, a final word for you before we move on to our next question? And we know that, I mean, I don't think our media um, partisanship is to the same extent as the United States, where there are real, as you know, real divisions across different media. But traditionally, media takes a stand. It, 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 it backs a side, if you like, particularly editorially um, in, in opinion pieces, if not in, in news. When it comes to something like Uluru Statement from the Heart, to bring it back to that, should the Murdoch press take a view? Or do you allow everybody to bring their own views to the table? How does the press operate in this environment? Well, I think the media has become increasingly polarised in this country. You're right, it's not, it, not, it's like not to the extent of the United States, but it's increasingly mm. polarised. You've got the, sort of the, the love media, as I call them, and, uh, which is in response, of course, to Bob Green calling the, the, the Murdoch media the hate media. But you, you've got the sort of Fairfax, ABC, Guardian, Click, and, and you've got News Corp. Um, 
issues like uh, the Uluru Statement in the Heart, you know, uh, uh, I argue my case, mm. I write my pieces, and in the same newspaper other people mm. write opposing points of view. I argue for this on my television show at 5 o'clock, Sky News, you can subscribe any time you like. Yeah, here he goes again. You but, straight a but, <laughs> but straight after me, Peter Credlin comes on and runs the entirely opposite argument. One day Peter and I must just uh, switch shows and, and, and go on each other's shows and have the debate. But you just have that... If you go back a, a step on the climate change issue, there was yeah. a big hullabaloo that uh, News Corp had come out with a corporate position backing net zero by 2050. Now, that's a corporate position that can be reflected in some editorials and, and, and by, and by the, the corporation, but all of the journalists, uh, we stick with whatever our views are. I've mm. never supported net zero by 2050 and many others haven't. Others argue in favour of it. I think it's very, very healthy to have that diversity of opinion, uh, which is why I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of it here. But we'll try better next time. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question comes from Azil Gadate. My question is to Julian. What will the coalition leadership teams do to change their focus back on listening to all Australians across diverse electorates and earn back the trust of voters? Well, thanks for the question. Um, we, we had a, a real message from the Australian people. We obviously lost seats um, in a whole range of areas. Um, and Peter Dutton and Susan Lee and, and the team um, are, are really trying to go out and listen to what Australians are saying in different places. There are places also where we've got swings. I mean, we've got swings in our favour in Tasmania, in some places in Western Sydney uh, and in Melbourne. So the electorate's saying a range of different things. And I think, as Chris has pointed out, uh, the Labor Party came to, to government with um, a, a drop in their primary vote to a, even to a historic low. But we're the ones that lost government, so we've got to particularly listen. And I think, you know, we've got to listen to what women are saying, we've got to listen to what uh, business people are saying, we've got to listen to the concerns of families. But I think, fundamentally, we've got to come up with some eye-catching policy um, that will actually give people something to come to the polling booth and vote for us for. I think uh, Chris's um, description of the election is largely right. Um, we didn't give people a big forward agenda and I think a lot of the pro problems that we're discussing tonight, a lot of the problems we've been discussing previously um, since the election would have been solved if we had had a bigger forward agenda more broadly. Uh, Julian, was there a sense, I mean obviously there was the Scott Morrison factor and people have put some of the blame onto that. Barnaby Joyce has lost his job on the Nats despite holding his, all, all, all of the seats that the, that the Nats had. So what are you looking for? Is it a change of image? Peter Dutton says he'll soften his image. Is it a policy direction change? Are there things that you're going to give up the fight on? For instance, you know, climate um, what was a big issue before. What does it look like, this change? I, I think it's actually talking about issues that resonate with Australians. Um, I think effectively we went to the public and we said to them, um, we've done a really good job with COVID, the other side are inexperienced, vote for us. Um, we never defended Scott Morrison from all the nasty personal attacks that went on for 18 months against, against him. Uh, and so his reputation um, was, was really badly trashed and we should, have, we should have responded to that much earlier. But more fundamentally, um, I think we need to come up with some policies that address the concerns of, of ordinary Australians. What's the future going to be like for their children? What's the future? What, what sort of education are their children getting? What sort of jobs will they do? Will they be able to afford houses? If we address those sorts of questions, I think we will be in a good position. But with respect, yeah. Julian, I'd add another thing. I think that your party was tone deaf to the moral sense in the community, particularly among young people, about climate change, yeah. saying, yeah. look, we... we <laughs> We don't, we don't understand the complexity of it all, but we want to be sure that we as Australians are doing our bit mm. and that we're doing our bit with everyone else, particularly given that we're such a large exporter of coal. And I think there are a lot of Australians, particularly young people, who say, well, if we keep exporting that amount of coal, we've got to at least be doing what everyone else in the West is committed to. And with respect, I think your party was immune to that change of moral sense in the community. Sh Shireen, so, so some of this was reflected in the, in the Teals vote. But to what extent do you think that was an expression of a frustration? To what extent would that vote be soft? And what does, what does the, the, the coalition now offer in response to that? Well, I think what Julian said is correct, that... I think the Liberal Party lost touch with its own electorates, you know, and if you're a big minister in Cabinet, that doesn't mean you can ignore the wishes and the, the aspirations of your own 
uh, electorate and your own voters. Ask Josh. Yeah, as, as, as um, we saw in Kuyong very clearly. Um, so I think what the Liberal Party needs to do is, as Julian said, start to really listen to voters. But also I think the election taught us that the ideological culture warring doesn't work in winning an election because it speaks to only a very narrow segment of the political spectrum. So I think there's a need to move, shift back into the centre and recapture some of that pragmatic, practical, compassionate conservatism. But, uh, Chris, um, you know, you and I would remember the 1980s when, you know, the Hawk, the, the, the Howard Peacock years and the battles between the wets and dries, the conservatives and the moderates, and, and, and John Howard returned to power when he really landed on what he saw as an authentic position for the party. What does an authentic position look like for, yeah, I, for I, Peter I, Dutton's I, Liberals? I, I couldn't disagree with Shireen and Frank Moore on, on this issue. For starters, the, the, the Teals didn't cost the coalition government. Uh, Labor winning seats off the coalition uh, costs the, the coalition government. It's made it harder, mm. given them a, a bigger gap to me make up next time. But, but those, it, it, those it seats didn't change it, government. Didn't it? By, by taking Mo Josh Frydenberg, Trent oh, Zimmerman... Yeah, and enormously Dave damaging. And, and moderates but, as well that are maybe not in the party now. But, but the coalition lost government because they sought to appease the alarmists on the in the climate argument. The coalition won in 2000, almost won in 2010, then won in 2013, 16, 19 by taking a more cautious approach on climate policy. The first time they go back to try and match Labor on climate policy, that is matching net zero by 2050, they lost mm. government. There, there, there's an enormous amount of misinformation being put out on the climate argument that so many on the coalition side know is false, but they won't challenge it. Instead of having the debate and getting reality into the debate, they tried to appease the climate push and it cost them government. Where was the coalition pointing out the fallacy that somehow Australian environmental policy can change the global climate sufficiently enough to reduce natural disasters in Australia. It's an absurd proposition because what we're arguing about, say, in our, in our 2030 targets, the difference between the parties is between reducing global emissions by 0.33% or 0.51%. That's the difference they're haggling over. At the same time, last year, China's greenhouse gas emissions increased by equivalent amount to Australia's total emissions. So to pretend that we can change our climate with our policies is a lie and is an absurdity. And the other point, sorry, uh, uh, Stan, I will finish. The other point is to um, just suggest also that we are not doing our share in this country is untrue. We've cut our emissions by 20%. We're continuing to cut them. That is more than most other developed economies. It is more than a proportionate response. Okay. Exactly. Well, well, we That's can, exactly right. We can, That's exactly right. We can, so we listen can, to the scientists. Entire, we can do an, another entire program on climate, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sure we will. But we are out of time almost. We need to get to our final question. It's a video from Sophia Latham. There are now 19 female ministers in government and the highest number of women in parliament ever. This shows that women are arguably the most important force in Australian politics today. My question is... What will it take for Australia to elect its second female Prime Minister? And who do you think this could be? Linda. <laughs> um, that may be both a question and an answer. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I will not say who it's going to be. I don't know. Is, is, is the woman in Parliament now who is likely to be the next female Prime Minister? Quite possibly. But I, what I can say is that the amount of women in Parliament now is higher than any other time. But in the Labor Party, and that's the party that I'm a member of, we have elected an overwhelming amount of women at this election. And the great thing about it is that they are women from diverse backgrounds. There's women from a, an Egyptian... Muslim woman that's just become a minister. Mm. And Ali. Uh, and Ali. There's, there's women from Sri Lanka, Vietnam. Um, six First Nations people were elected, uh, three, of them, three of them women. Just a wonderful diversity. And the Labor Party is now about 56% women 
Um, and I think the rest of the parliament's about 20, 23, 24%. And the way in which we've gotten to that is through affirmative action. I know that that's frowned upon in some parties, but we've taken deliberate steps mm. to make sure that the parliament is more reflective and our party's more reflective of the Australian community. And it's working. Shereen? I think there's a lot of talented and experienced women in the parliament now. So I, I don't know there's too many to choose from. But I think the increasing diversity of parliament that we're now seeing is long overdue and it's good to see. More important though than I think the identity of the parliamentarians is if they deliver on their promises. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see how a Labor government is going to take us to a voice referendum in their first term, deliver cheap, cheaper childcare, enact an ICAC, things like that. So I'm really looking forward to the future. But yep, the electors need to hold them to account. There is hope. Now, now, I have to hold the, the three gentlemen on the panel to a very short answer because we're almost done, but Julie and Lisa, who on your side of politics now, if we're talking about a future female Prime Minister, who, who puts their hand up, do you think? Look, I'm not going to give anyone the kiss of death. I think no. we've got very good, uh, uh, very good uh, women that have just come in, people like Zoe McKenzie. Uh, we've got two Indigenous senators that, are, that have come in on our side, so that's very exciting. But we do need to encourage more women to stand for Parliament on our side and to be supported when they stand. And um, I, I committed last year to do what I can to use what political capital I have to encourage more women in my party to stand, and I'll continue to do so. Chris and then Frank. Look, I would have thought that Tanya Plibersek was looking one of the most likely, but that's why she's been sent to the bush uh, to buy a new pair of Varian Williams and a dryser bone and <laughs> see what happens out there, see how Albo goes. But um, I, th I, think, uh, I think the Liberals need to address this. I think they need to uh, look at quotas because targets haven't worked. A target is just a quota that you don't have to meet. So I think when it comes to female representation, then I, then I think it's one, one case where you could justify a quota because Parliament's supposed to be representative. Mm. You need to make sure that, that that's the most important difference between us. It doesn't matter what religion we are, what race we are, what our sexuality is. The, the one fundamental difference in, in, in humans is, is male and female, and we should try and have reasonably equal, equal representation of them in, in Parliament. I can be very short. As a Catholic priest, I'm not competent to comment. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. We'll save that one for another day. Um, Frank, thank you so much. And again, thank you for your thank father's you. service to our country. It was yeah. you know, Pleasure. Yeah. an extraordinary yeah. achievement. Thank you. And that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Shereen Morris, Julian Lisa, Linda Burney, Chris Kenny, Frank Brennan, and of course earlier, Gail Marbo. Thanks to everyone for your questions and to you at home for joining in our conversation as well. Virginia Trioli is in the seat next week. She'll be with you live from Sydney exploring the power of performance joined by a panel of artists and thinkers, including music legends Darren Hayes, Katie Noonan and cook, writer and TV presenter Adam Liao. Until then, have a good night.